Well, if you would, take out your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be examining verses 9 through 14. And the book of Colossians is a prison epistle, meaning that Paul would have written this letter um, during his imprisonment in Rome. It is written to the church at Colossae. They are a fairly young church, and they were planted by a man named Epaphras. At some point, Epaphras visited Paul while in prison and shared with him a report of everything happening in Colossae. And we can see in the opening verses what sort of report Paul must have received. If you look at verse 4, they have faith in Christ and love for one another. Verse 5, they are motivated by and sticking to the hope that they first heard in the gospel. Verse 6, they have understood the truth of God's grace, and now the gospel is bearing fruit in them. So for these reasons, Paul thanks God for them and prays for them, verse 3, and is happy to call them saints and faithful brethren, verse 2. This letter then is an expression of gratitude and excitement on Paul's part. And so he writes to encourage them in their faith. But Paul also writes to instruct them further in their faith, to teach them how those who have received Christ Jesus the Lord are now to live in him. He also writes to them concerning the denial of certain false doctrines uh, so that they would continue to cling to Christ and not be swayed from the truth toward legalism or Gnosticism or to be deceived into thinking that somewhere out there there existed some greater fullness than what God offers through Christ in the gospel. Paul's concern is that they would have a well-rounded and Christ-grounded faith in all of its fullness. And our section today, spanning verses 9 to 14, is of particular importance because this forms a prayer which Paul states he is regularly praying for the Colossians since hearing of their faith. This prayer is helpful to us in several ways. Um, first, this prayer models what godly prayer looks like, both in his motivation and in the content of the prayer itself. Paul shows us an earnestness that we would do well to replicate, an earnestness for the spiritual well-being of his brothers and sisters. And his prayer is grounded in the gospel, and it is thoughtful in what it requests for the saints. Second, this prayer zeroes in on the most important ingredients necessary for living a godly life. Uh, this prayer doesn't have any fluff, but it focuses in on the fundamentals of spiritual growth. When Paul prays for the Colossians, he is asking precisely the same things for them that we ourselves need and ought to be praying for each other. And then third, this prayer leads us to praise the glories of Christ. From top to bottom, everything contained in this prayer is Christ-centered. Paul's request for their spiritual development is based in what is already theirs in Christ, and so this prayer rightly crescendos in the praise of God for redemption in Christ Jesus, showing that Jesus is both our means and our end. So, let us pray and ask the Lord to bless this time, and then we will dive in. Lord, we do look forward to seeing what you would have us learn tonight from your word. Help us to come humbly before your truth so that we wouldn't try to change it, but that it would change us. And be with me as I preach. Keep me from error and help me to be clear. And may your word further shape your people into conformity with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's read together. Colossians 1, and we're going to start in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. Well, Paul introduces this prayer by stating his reason for praying it in the first place, which happens to be the same reason he writes this letter. He begins, for this reason, since the day we heard of it, referring back to verse four, since we heard of your faith and love. Remember, it is upon receiving a report from Epaphras concerning their faith that Paul begins to pray for them regularly. Paul knows the importance of prayer, and he knows that the Colossians need it. Even though Paul did not plant this church and he hasn't seen them face to face, he's still so moved from um, hearing Epaphras' report of their faith that he really has no choice but to pray for them. He is driven to pray for them. And so he asks God regularly, grow them in the fundamentals of the faith. And just think how encouraging it would have been for Paul sitting there in prison to receive this report from Epaphras, to hear that even as he sits there locked up, the gospel is going forth with power and wrestling souls out of the hands of sin and death and reconciling them to God. And just as Paul was surely encouraged by the report, so now he encourages them. And imagine being one of those saints in Colossae who receives this letter from the apostle Paul to know that a godly man like he and, and like Timothy, that they have been praying and going before God regularly, interceding on their behalf, requesting that through all the trials they face and all the confusion brought by false teaching and all the varied forms of persecution, that through all this, they would be firmly planted, grounded in the truth, strengthened by God, and made to persevere. How good to know that godly men are praying that their faith would flourish. And this is the kind of prayer you and I need, isn't it? Um, prayer that, that you would grow in knowing God and, and knowing his will, and that you would be strengthened to live it out. Well, I can happily tell you that you are being prayed for in this way. After all, any pastor worth their salt is regularly praying for every member in his congregation, praying this. And I can assure you that your pastor prays this for you regularly. But not only is Paul's prayer a model for pastors, it is a model for everyone. If you can recognize your own need for the things outlined in this prayer, then surely you can understand how those around you need them as well. And so I would encourage you, pray for one another regularly. Um, flip over a couple pages to chapter 4 and look at verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2 reads, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. And after stating this in verse 3, um, Paul even requests that they would pray for him and for his ministry. So you see, we are commanded to pray, and, and even Paul needed prayer. You can go back to chapter 1. So just as you need prayer, so do your brothers and your sisters and your elders. And to look at prayers such as this one, um, this gives us a great example of how we can be praying for one another. So looking back to chapter one, verse nine, we're going to start to see the content of the prayer. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this really is the request of Paul's prayer. This, this is the petition um, to ask that you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This, this is it. And everything that follows this, everything else, is really going to come about as a result of God answering this petition. So if God answers this, then all the other stuff should come about as a result. And that's why our first point is to pray that you would be will-knowing. Pray that you would be will-knowing. But before we dive into the concept of knowing God's will, um, I first want to draw your attention to the word filled, that you would be filled with knowledge of God's will. This is the word uh, plerao. Greek class is paying off, see? Um, and it doesn't mean to be filled just a little bit. 
Um, this isn't like the waiter stopping by at your table to top off your glass. This is a liberal pouring, a more than sufficient supply so that you would have so much that it would cause you to abound in that thing. In this case, having an abounding knowledge of God's will. It's a fullness that doesn't just occupy space in your mind, but fills so as to shape the person being filled. I want to pause here for a second and point out something that I think is really important to notice. And it has to do with some of Paul's presuppositions. What Paul knows about God and what he understands about man's relationship to God in Christ causes Paul to ask for and to expect certain things as he prays. Let me show you what I mean. Um, First, we have the word filled in verse 9. Filled with what? Knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Verse 11, strengthened with all power, attaining all steadfastness and patience. Do you see the pattern? And if you keep going through the rest of the letter, you'll see this language continue. All, every, full, complete, etc. And the reason Paul can use language like this and it not be considered hyperbole is because Paul actually believes that God is sufficient to supply these things to his people. Paul believes the same thing about God as Peter does, for example. When Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 3, that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Again, that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Paul's prayer here in Colossians is that God would grow believers, not using something additional that they don't already have in salvation, but using what is already theirs in Christ and has been theirs since the very moment of conversion and is shared among all believers everywhere in equal measure. So when Paul asks that you be filled He does so knowing that the believer has access to that which can fill him. When Paul asks that you be strengthened, as he does in a little bit, he does so knowing that God has made the strength fully available to the believer. So Paul's presupposition in this prayer and throughout this letter is that God is powerful enough to provide these things and that God has given every believer access to the whole of it in Christ. For Paul... This is never a matter of gaining something that you don't already have, but of growing in what is already present because of your union with Christ. And that is a sweet thing. This truth um, cuts two ways, however. Well, first, it means that as a Christian, you have what is necessary. You are sufficiently equipped. What a relief. But second, it means that an I can't do it sort of attitude really doesn't make sense in the Christian life. Like you, I am well acquainted with the treasure trove of justifications for not living a godly life in certain areas. Um, If if you only knew what I went through this week, what what my job is like, or the way my wife is when no one is around. Um, This is not, this is, yeah. Or the degree of temptation that I'm faced with, or what my working environment is like, the pressure I'm under to conform, or the errors of my religious background that is all this baggage behind me, or the environment that I grew up in. If you were in my shoes, then it would make sense why I cannot be godly in this specific area in my life. But this truth shreds those excuses to pieces, doesn't it? I mean, God has provided for us an abundantly sufficient supply of help for us to live godly lives. Now, of course, our flesh tries to justify sin or minimize it, but we are not victims. God has provided for us so as to meet our every need if we would have it. That's part of what makes this prayer so important. We are helpless in our flesh, but God offers us help sufficient to defeat sin and walk in obedience. In Christ, we are complete and we have what is necessary. So Paul's prayer is that we would be filled, specifically that we would be, verse nine, filled with knowledge, knowledge. It's fascinating to look in scripture and see how often God directly addresses our intellect. Um, Consider, for example, how you came to faith. 
Ultimately, we know that conversion is a work of the spirit on our hearts, but part of that conversion had to do with you hearing a series of propositions in the form of the gospel and recognizing those propositions to be true. Your faith did not come apart from a knowledge of the gospel. Our repentance is understood, at least in part, to be a change of mind. Um, In Romans 12, Paul describes how we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Ephesians 6, Paul demonstrates how our spiritual warfare is essentially a battle for the mind. In Colossians 3, 2, we are instructed to test or to set our mind on things above. Romans 8, 6, the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. God concerns himself with our minds. After all, not a single word we speak, not a single action we perform happens all by itself and apart from our mind. And so if we are ever to live godly lives, then our minds need to be filled with godly knowledge. And in this case, knowledge of God's will, we must be well knowing. God's will in the sense Paul is using here isn't a mystery. Uh, Many in the context of Colossae may have thought of God's will as being some hidden occult knowledge only available to the initiated. Paul's prayer clearly demonstrates this is not the case. It is available to all believers, not just a select few. We would also be mistaken to think that Paul is referring to God's will in the sense of his sovereign will over all creation, his providential determinations. Um, Another mistake would be to think that Paul is referring to some personalized, custom-tailored, hyper-specific revelation related directly to your individual circumstances so that you might be able to discern Um, what city God would have you live in or what pants to put on or what to eat for lunch. This is not what Paul is getting at here. Rather, the will which we are to be filled with the knowledge of is that which is available to us in the pages of Scripture. It is the will revealed to us in his word. And the reason Paul prays this is simple enough, I think. After all, if we are to do this will, first we have to know what it is. Not only do we need to know what it is, we also have to understand it. We have to know how to apply it. And I think that's what Paul is getting at when he says at the end of verse 9, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You could have every command memorized and categorized in your brain, and that might not do you even a bit of good. Knowing God's will is not merely having access to it. That, that isn't enough. Yes, we need the knowledge in our head, the specifics of God's will as revealed in scripture, but we also need to understand how that translates into our lives. How do we take the concept of God's will and implement this into reality? How do we bridge the gap between theory and practice? And this is part of the prayer, to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Not just that we would, we would know God's will, but that we would know how to apply it and live it out. Now, thankfully, um, the request is for spiritual wisdom and understanding. That is wisdom coming from the help of the Holy Spirit. Part of the Spirit's role in the life of a Christian is to take truth and to apply it to our hearts in such a way so as to enable us to live that truth out. And so as we seek to know God's will, we also depend on the spirit to help us understand it and apply it to our hearts so that we are changed by it and produce a different way of living. Now, I just want to give a quick warning here because it is incredibly easy to have knowledge and not apply it and still feel like everything is fine. If knowledge isn't translating into action, then something is wrong. Something's clogged up. Something needs to be investigated and addressed. And so this person needs to pray. Pray that the Spirit would help them to have wisdom and understanding so that they can apply knowledge. Or else that knowledge is just going to puff them up. It's going to do them no good. In fact, it's going to bring greater condemnation in their disobedience because they know better. Um, Just within the past week, we saw an example of someone with immense knowledge fall into gross sin. So knowledge by itself, it isn't enough. Having something in your head does not guarantee you will do righteousness and avoid wickedness. So don't neglect this. 
um, pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding and seek to take God's truth and apply it. Never study for the sake of studying or learn for the sake of learning, but gain knowledge so that you can act on it and pray this for others as well, that they would do the same. Just look at verse 10, um, the next part of Paul's prayer. So that, purpose statement, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. Our next point then is pray for worthy walking or worthy walking. Yes. Um, The point of knowledge isn't to know, but to do. Nobody buys furniture from Ikea just to flip through the assembly instructions. Who cares if bolt A goes into slot C unless in the end you have a new set of shelves. Proper application of a knowledge of God's will results in a particular way of life, a certain way of walking. And here Paul uses the word worthy. Now, some have taken this to mean that we are to walk in such a way as to make ourselves worthy to God. This is absolutely not the case. And I want to just quickly show you why. Um, Flip over to chapter two, look at verse six. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and, and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed. So the point is, Paul isn't saying we are to walk so as to be worthy of God, but that we are to walk in a way that is consistent with all that we have in Christ. This is really important point to grasp, actually, because the only reason that we are able to be built up and grow in these ways is because of all that we have already received in Christ. Our growth and development then should look consistent to the basis of our faith, which is Christ. This is similar to what Paul calls for elsewhere. Um, Philippians 1.27, conduct, your, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Ephesians 4.1, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And this point will become even more clear, I think, as we come to verses 12 and 14 and see that our status is firmly established in Christ, while our call to live in godliness is the fruit of this reality. This should also help us in understanding the next phrase in verse 10, to please him in all respects, which is our next point, Lord pleasing. As Christians, there is a manner of living which pleases the Lord. But again, like with the last point, we have to distinguish between pleasing God in a salvific way and what Paul means here. As you read scripture, it becomes pretty clear that we cannot please God with our flesh. We cannot please God by obeying enough of the law. Um, Isaiah 53 even shows that God was pleased by the atoning work of Christ on our behalf. The only way we can please God salvifically is through Christ. It is his work that is pleasing to God, not ours. We cannot please God so as to merit righteousness. Rather, our righteousness is found in Christ alone. So, in what sense can we please God? Well, certainly living in a worthy manner in which our thinking, words, and actions are regulated by a precise and correct understanding of what God loves and hates and expects from us, would bring God pleasure as we live that out. The concept of pleasing God really forces us to look not to our own desires, but to God's desires so that we would conduct ourselves according to his will and seeking to please him. It causes us to ask, am I aiming to please myself or am I aiming to please men or the world? Let Paul's be, or let Paul's prayer be our prayer that our aim would be to please God. Uh, This leads us to our next point. Pray that we would be fruit bearing. Fruit bearing. Worthy walking means bearing good fruit. Fruit that comes from our being rooted in Christ. And if we refer back to verse 6, we can see that the fruit Paul is praying for the Colossians to bear, to increase in bearing, is really the fruit of the gospel being born through them. So this fruit bearing is totally the opposite of their previous way of life. Um, Verse 21, Paul reminds them that they were formerly engaged in evil deeds. They had rotten, evil fruit 
But now as those who have been transformed by the power of the gospel, they are to bear fruit in every good work. And remember, this is one of the reasons that we were saved. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And as we grow in our knowledge of God's will, it makes sense that we would increasingly bear greater fruit. The Christian life is, is one of progress. Even though it can be a little bit of a roller coaster, there's an upward trajectory. And as we go along, we should see an increase in fruit. And as the next phrase states, we should also see an increase in the knowledge of God. Our next point is that we would be God knowing. Now we've, we've already seen that uh, part of Paul's prayer is that Christians would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And here in verse 10, we see that we need to grow in the knowledge of God himself. Both fruit bearing and increasing in the knowledge of God should be understood as things which are continually taking place in the Christian life. The Christian walk is never to be stagnant, but always growing and increasing. And as we walk worthily, our fruit will increase and our knowledge of God will increase. And for a moment, just consider some of the practical ways that God actually brings this about in your life. And maybe you'll be able to observe how this is happening right now. As you pray, as you read your Bible, as you hear God's word preached, as you go to Bible study, part of what is happening is that you are coming to know God in a more intimate way. Just compare how much you knew about God during your first month of being a Christian versus how much you know now. And consider how much more you will know about him after 10 years or 20 years or 30 years of walking with him. And what a sweet cycle this is, wherein the more you know God, the more you know his will, the more you know what is pleasing to him, which leads to even more knowledge of him as you walk in the light of his word. So this brings us then to verse 11 and our next point. Pray for God's strengthening. God's strengthening. God knows you well, believe it or not. He knows your abilities. He knows your weaknesses. He knows that the call to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord is a high call. He knows that to live so as to please him is a difficult task. In fact, he knows it's an impossible task. He knows the weak, frail, sin-prone people that we are in the flesh. And God does not expect you to do all of this or any of this by your own strength. That would be impossible. You would stumble. You would fall. You do not have it within yourself to carry out any of this. In fact, if Paul were praying for you to do this by your own strength, it would be a pointless prayer. It would be like asking your four-year-old to break loose the lug nuts on your car. We just don't have it in us. That's why one of the essential ingredients to this prayer is strength. Look at verse 11. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And Paul knows what he's talking about here. He himself didn't shy away from attributing any good thing in his own life and ministry to the strength of God. Paul relied on the power of God when preaching the gospel to the Corinthians so that their faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5. Paul recognized that in his weakness, the power of Christ was magnified, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. He explained in Philippians 4, 10 through 13, how he was able to operate faithfully in whatever circumstances he found himself, saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. And he makes this power accessible to us through Christ so that we might be strengthened according to his glorious might, so that we can live the Christian life, and as verse 11 says, so that we can attain all steadfastness and patience. Empowered by God, we can be steadfast. This is the characteristic of someone who is immovable, who is so fixed on his purpose and loyalty to God that nothing can sway him, not even the most difficult trial or the most horrendous suffering. Similar, similarly, being empowered by God means that we can be patient, able to endure and persevere even in the midst of struggle. If faced with difficulty, if given no option for escape, by God's strength, we can faithfully endure it to the end. Do not underestimate the immense kindness of such grace. 
that God offers you his own strength so that you would not fail nor falter. All that he offers you is more than sufficient for any task. Pray that he would strengthen you and pray that he would strengthen your brothers and sisters so that we would all be able to stand firm through the difficulties of this life. Such grace is certainly cause for gratitude, which brings us to our final point. Pray that we would be thanksgiving. Just as Paul prays that Christians would grow in knowledge of God and his will and increase in fruit bearing and rely on God's strength for steadfastness and patience, so Paul prays that Christians would develop in their gratitude to God for all he has accomplished in Christ. Let's reread this last section together, starting in verse 12. Joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, looking around this room, I have heard most of your testimonies. Um, Whether you've shared them publicly all at once or in private conversation or bits and pieces here and there. Many of you have little to no reservation when sharing how it is that God brought you to faith. And these stories are precious to us because we understand that they mark the moment or the season when your life truly began. When you were born again, made new. And something else that I've noticed when hearing these testimonies is the overwhelming sense of gratitude holding the whole story together, like whatever material it is that keeps fruit suspended in fruitcake. And I have no idea what that is. But salvation, it's, it's, it's surrounded by and it produces thankfulness to God. It's, it's unavoidable. Once you've been shown grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, to have gone from being under God's wrath to living in his grace, there becomes this insatiable need to praise God and to worship him in joyous gratitude for all that he has accomplished in Christ. That's what we see here in this final section of Paul's prayer. Pray for thanksgiving. As you can see, Paul spends a bit more time on this final point than he has the others, and we will as well. So what does Paul say that we are to give thanks for? Well, let's look at it here. The main point is that the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This implies, of course, that at one time we were not qualified, but God has taken some action that has made us qualified, making us sufficient or fit to share in the inheritance. It also says that however it is that we became qualified, it was thanks to the Father. It was not thanks to us. Our thankfulness is aimed strictly Godward because he did the qualifying. So how is it that the Father made us qualified? Well, here we see two ways, rescue and transfer. First, he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And remember our former state. Uh, Before the Lord saved us, Um, to paraphrase Ephesians 2, you were dead in sin, walking according to the course of this world, and according to the devil, you were living in lust and indulging the desires of the flesh and mind, and you were under God's wrath. Romans 6, you were slaves of sin, resulting in death. Ephesians 6 describes the existence of spiritual forces of wickedness who reign in darkness, Forces that now wage war against the saints, but before these forces were ruling over you. And I take the domain of darkness to basically be this whole complex of things that are wicked and set against God. This includes the devil and his demonic forces and their oppressive rule. And it includes man's participation with these forces as he lives enslaved to his sin and walking according to his flesh in rebellion against God. It is a domain consisting of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is the dominion of sin. It is the place where we were and would have remained, if not for God's gracious intervention. From this, we have been rescued. 
He rescued us not only from the horrors of that realm, but from the consequences of being in it. Remember, there is coming a day when God will judge the world in righteousness and his wrath will be poured out on all those who remain under the domain of darkness. Our rescue then is not just from the domain itself, but also from the wrath which will fall upon it. So the father has qualified us. The first thing he did to qualify us was to rescue us. The second is this, that he transferred us. He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, or literally to the kingdom of the son of his love. Um, We have some families in our church who came here from California. And though their reasons for leaving that state may vary, there were some common factors, right? When they lived in California, they had to abide by the laws of California. That means they had to pay like really high taxes and they had to endure aggressively liberal policies and they had to tolerate a great deal of government corruption and uh, green stuff. But they moved, they moved. Uh, California can raise their taxes all they want now, but for those families who have fled to Arkansas, it does not matter. They are no longer under the dominion of California, but they have been transferred to a new realm of authority here in Arkansas. And that's what the father has done. He has rescued us and he has transferred us. We were under one dominion. Now we are under another. We were in the domain of darkness, but now we are in the kingdom of the son of his love. And there is something interesting here that I just want to touch on briefly in order to make a little clarification. And if this is something that you would like more material on, then um, I can make that available to you or Greg could. But Paul says that the father has transferred us to the kingdom of Jesus. Um, Some take this verse as evidence that the kingdom is in full force right now and that it must be spiritual in nature. But if we study the matter further, we can see that Paul's writings are filled with tension between what is realized in one sense and is still future in another. I mean, first we have this, that we have already been brought into God's kingdom. Uh, But 123 says that the gospel has already been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and that we have already been not only made alive in Christ 2.13, but have also been raised with him into heaven 3.1, and that God has already disarmed the powers and authorities 2.15. Just as there is a sense in which those things are accomplished in Christ, and yet we are awaiting their realization, so too, though we have been transferred into Christ's kingdom, we shouldn't expect that realization of that kingdom is right now in all its fullness. So what is this text saying to us? Well, we are no longer under the domain of darkness, but are citizens of Christ's kingdom. We are no longer under the rule of the devil and in bondage to sin, but we are under the reign of Christ as our king. And this is a reality for believers right now, even as we await the full realization of his kingdom on earth. And finally, Paul expounds on this further, pointing to that one singular act by which we are qualified, rescued, and transferred. Verse 14, that in Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And this surely is the mountain peak of this prayer, as the redemption we have in Christ through his blood is the basis for the entirety of our Christian faith, and certainly the basis for everything in the prayer. The truth of our redemption in Jesus Christ is to so reverberate in our hearts and minds that thankfulness is poured out in our lives. You, O sinner, have been redeemed by Jesus. You, who have sinned against God, have had your sins forgiven in Christ. I don't want to step on the toes of Harrison because uh, he's going to be covering all this in a couple weeks. But if you read ahead a bit, you can be reminded of just how big of a deal this is. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Through him, all things were created. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. This Jesus, in order to reconcile all things to himself, went to the cross to pay the penalty of sin and redeem us, making us holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is the gospel, the good news by which we are saved. And it is because of what Christ has done that we are able to, by his strength and in his wisdom, according to his word, walk lives worthy of him. 
What a wonderful way for Paul to, to conclude this prayer. What a glorious truth for us to reflect on here. So what should we do with all of this? Well, I think the most obvious thing is we can pray. Um, pray these things for yourself. Be praying these things for one another. Pray that you would be well-knowing, that you would be worthy walking. Pray that you would be Lord-pleasing and fruit-bearing and knowledge-growing. And pray for God's strengthening. And pray that you would grow in thanksgiving and your gratitude for the redemption that you have in Christ. So let's pray. Lord, um, we do thank you for your word, which we saw tonight. Just pray that now that we've heard it, that your spirit would be at work applying it to our hearts and to our lives and that we would be seeking to see how it is that we can live your word out. Help us to to be so passionate about the faith of our fellow saints and to be so concerned with them and with their walk that we would pray for them regularly, that we would that we would constantly be interceding, that they would be growing and bearing fruit and coming to know you more. And help us even to pray for one another's gratitude that as we walk through this life as Christians, that we would come to have a fuller and fuller understanding of the gospel and all that has been done in Christ and all that is still yet to come as a result of Christ and him crucified. Lord, I pray that you would bless the remainder of our time together. And I, I just thank you for, um, for this time that we've had in Jesus name. Amen.